I want you to get up on your feet because I have a gift for you today. If you are perceptive, you would have already figured out that I'm not preaching because I don't preach behind one of these little frou-frou tables. That can only mean one thing. It must mean Pastor Judas Smith is in the house. What? Who? Hold up. Hold up. Here's why they're excited. Pastor Judas Smith is the greatest communicator of my generation. He is a trendsetter. He's a good person. He is handsome. He is tall. He is dapper. He is a New York Times best-selling author. Go get, the, go get the books. Go get Jesus Is, and then when you finish that, get Life Is. That's a bold title, man. Life Is. He can tell you all about life in 214 pages. He is the pastor of the City Church. He is one of the most sought-after speakers in the world today. He is, he is breaking new ground in Los Angeles, California. And the way you know I love you is I brought him to you today. That's what I do for those I love. And we're so thankful he could be here to share with us this weekend. He's also here to support the Seattle Seahawks in their final game of the NFL season. Would you welcome to the stage Pastor Judah Smith? Do it, y'all! Show us! Thank you so much. You can be seated. Thank you so much, Elevation Church. It is um, honestly uh, a ridiculous honor of mine to, to be here. Um, we have gathered tonight, of course, under the commonality of Jesus. We certainly have not gathered tonight under the commonality of a football team. <laughs> but what's awesome is that Jesus is transcendent beyond our um, professional football divide. Uh, tomorrow, I suppose, we will discover um, what city the Lord prefers. Um, you could take it a step further. I suppose this might be a bit of a quantum leap, but I think we could probably figure out who God favors more between me and my friend Stephen as well tomorrow. Pastor, I feel like we'll be able to find out where we stand in the cosmos, and uh, it's going to be a big day. <laughs> I'm pumped. We'll get to more football. We have to talk a little bit of football before I go any further, but I don't want to joke anymore. I mean, I will in a few minutes. Um, but I, I love this church, and uh, today uh, I had the privilege of kind of ministering and, and serving the, the Seahawks, and so uh, it's, a, it's a thrill to be able to kind of come here with them. But even today with some of the, some of the staff, we we're talking about Pastor Stephen and talking about Elevation Church. And I grew up, I'm a seventh generation preacher as, as far back as we can tell. And uh, you know, I heard my dad pray for revival, and I heard grandparents pray for revival, and I've been in all night prayer watch meetings, which were the worst meetings ever. <laughs> Just to be really honest with you, they're my least favorite thing we do in all of Christendom. Um, I prefer sleep. So, um, but I've been there. You know, we prayed for revival. And what's funny about Christians is like we're famous for praying for revival, but we might be equally famous for missing revival when it's happening. And um, it is. Uh, you're, 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 you're in the midst of what is probably more than a revival. It's a it's a reformation. I mean, it really is. And I, I hope you're leaning in, and I hope you're enjoying it, and I think it is to be enjoyed. I think God is ultimately to, ultimately to be enjoyed, and I, I hope that you're enjoying your community. And, um, you know, <clears throat> there's a, a lot of places I've had the privilege of just talking about Jesus and, and that sort of thing, but 
there's only a handful of places where I can come and stand in front of a community and say that, you know, your pastors mean so much to me personally. And, and I'll just go on record to say that Pastor Stephen and Holly are way better friends to Chelsea and I than we are to them. Uh, I, get, I get like three gifts annually, um, sometimes for no particular reason, just stuff, gear. I got a brand new backpack when I came into the hotel. This, and just, he, he, this couple gives their generous... Um, and you know, it's about this time some, some will say like, okay, come on, preacher, it's about Judah. and We love Pastor Stephen and Holly, but come on, it's about Jesus. Well, the truth is, um, Jesus has left the earth in physical, physical, t- <laughs> visible, physical, tangible form. And he's left average people like you and me. And um, he asked people to do crazy stuff. And a few of us go, okay, I'll do it. And we wouldn't be here. And 13 campuses wouldn't be expanding and exploding without the ridiculous, illogical courage and faith of this man and woman. And uh, I love them a lot. And I hope you do as well. I love both of you. And, um, you know, sometimes you need somebody from the outside to tell you how good it is. What's really cool is that some of you, this is where you met Jesus. And so you actually think that this is how church is, which is, by the way, don't ever wake up from that awesome dream. I highly recommend you stay right there in that beautiful space. But for some of us who've been around the block a little bit, you realize that this is an absolute supernatural anomaly. And um, it's incredible. So... I know this sounds crazy, but you know, during the just extraordinary worship experiences, we're using music as this platform to connect with God, and the, you know the lyrics are brilliant. I've, I've never even heard uh, that one song, which was amazing, and uh, I just loved it. And so I'm going to sing it again and again. Um, but uh, it, it's it's uh, I feel Jesus, you know, and, and as I'm standing here and and we're worshiping together. I, I think just to be honest, I'm really excited to preach, and, and I, I'm one of those guys that likes to talk, you know, all that, but I think I came really primarily to remind you how blessed you are and to remind you what phenomenal things that God is doing in this part of the country, in your world, what you have in the leadership and the pastors here. Um, gratitude is a powerful force in the universe, isn't it? And when you're grateful, so, boy, let's savor this, you know, enjoy this. And I just want to say that obviously your, your, your football team and any kind of loss that they might in experience, I don't think reflects what God is doing here at Elevation Church. I do think there is slightly a disconnect there, and, and that's okay. Can I just say that? You be free from any condemnation if tomorrow's football game doesn't unfold like you planned. Uh, there is still a God. Now, y'all know how we got to town, right? I don't know if you watched the game last week. I mean, do you realize, like, is that is it unnerve you at all that God literally, wide left is the sweetest words I've heard in a long time. So it just um, God is amongst our team. So just saying it for what it's worth. Uh, someone's sitting here right now like, so does this guy ever get to the word? But anyways... Um, I love you. Most of you wouldn't, wouldn't know who I am. I had the privilege of pastoring the church in Seattle, Washington, and in, and in Los Angeles, and, and now in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, uh, over five years ago, my dad passed away, and I was uh, absolutely, how should I say, tricked into taking over leadership of the community. I still miss youth pastoring. I still miss being, I was a janitor at first at our church, and can I just say, those were simpler beautiful days. And uh, leading young people is such a thrill because you can just tell them what to do. (laughs) Adults, you have so many layers and complexities. But um, that's me. I get to lead an amazing community. And uh, Stephen and I took time today, Pastor Stephen and I just talking and laughing and just, I think, both of us expressing what a thrill it is to be pastors. And it's, it's, you know how people say it's humbling. I want to take it a step further. It's humiliating, to be honest. When I think about the next 37 minutes, you're going to give me space in your mind and your heart. Um, that's, it's, it's overwhelming. And I know it's something that I take 
um, as such a, a precious thing that is to be steward. And, and I have been with your pastor when none of you are around, and he doesn't have to talk like this, but I know he feels the same way, that it's such a thrill and a sacred thing that he gets to lead you and inspire you and serve you. And um, again, that's a, that's a special thing. So I'd love to share the Bible with you. Uh, if you are new to this experience and new to this, and this is like your first church experience, that's awesome. Um, make sure you come back next week to hear Pastor Stephen, and he will fix all of the ridiculous things that I say, and that will be awesome. Um, but I'm going to take the next uh, 36 minutes, and it should be reasonably painless, and we're going to read a portion of the Scripture. What I love about what we're doing is that it's absolutely, it's intrinsically connected to what happened essentially 2,000 years ago. And by the way, organized religion was not organized by man. It was instituted by God, and Jesus said, I'm going to build a community. I'm going to build a collection, a gathering of followers, and they're going to get together, and they're going to honor me and worship me. So for thousands of years now, Jesus followers have been getting together, and it's oftentimes included food, which is an awesome thing. And I think, you know, the Elevation Church is to go to the next level. I think food will be included in the experience. I think that would be awesome. It's like you could order whatever you want, you know, but just saying, I don't, you know, I submit that to the leadership here. Um, but there's been food, there's been singing, there's been reading of scripture, there's been dialogue, conversation. So what we're doing tonight is not something new. It's fresh and new because it's 2016 and God's doing new things and new hearts. But this, this beautiful uh, gathering is something that's been happening for thousands of years. And that thrills me to think that we've been doing this for a long time and, and that it works. Like it, it actually alters the trajectory of people's destiny and life and existence. And so we believe that going to this book can, can transform thoughts and ideas that can ultimately transform priorities and scheduling in your daily, everyday life. How many know Saturday night doesn't matter unless it changes some ordinary Wednesday or alters your schedule on Friday? And so we're going to talk about stuff that I think will really transform the way that we live. Would you go with me? If you have a Bible, if you don't, I think we're going to put it up on the screen. Um, First John and, and chapter four, I'm going to read a, just a few verses. And... Um, I've got a runny nose. It just happened on the flight over, and so, um, and chances are I'll start crying. So then, it, you know, it won't be a big deal. But until then, if I sniffle a few times, are you are you cool with that? Have y'all seen this commercial where somebody sneezes or coughs and it's like blue vapor? It's haunting me. I'm serious. I can't get it out of my head. Someone coughs. I was on a plane, obviously, to get here, and, and the person next to me is like coughing, and I'm like, oh gosh, the blue vapor is like. <clears throat> in my mouth, and I just so, it annoys me when like public speakers are coughing or sniffling, because it's like, ah, take care of yourself. But I'm that person, okay? So <laughs> bear with me. By the way, I've been married for 16 years, have three children. Zion is now 11. L Dog or Elliot is nine, and Gracie is six. Two boys and, 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 and a little girl, and I miss them. I FaceTimed them today and uh, told them, um, you know, showed them where the Seahawks were practicing and promised them a victory tomorrow. First John, that's what dads do, you know? First John chapter 4, and I'm just going to read a few verses from 7 to verse 12. And uh, contextually, if I could give you just a little bit of, a little bit of heads up here before we approach this, this, this passage. Um, it, the, the letter's called First John, and it's written um, by a guy by the name of John. And it's, he, it's about probably 50 years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. John is one of the 12 disciples. He's known as John the Beloved. Some term him as John the Favorite Disciple. He is the author of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, he's the author of John, the Gospel of John. By the time he writes First John, again, he's a much older man. Jesus has levitated into the clouds some 50 years before. He's now Grandpa John. He's living in what we believe was ancient Ephesus at the time. He's got gray hair. He is kind of reflecting on life, friendship with Jesus, and he hears these uh, troubling rumors from a collection of Jesus communities in Asia Minor. And so he puts pen to paper under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to kind of address the systemic issue within this community. People are leaving some of the churches. They're essentially bored with Jesus. They want more than just the same old, same old, Jesus died for my sins. 
like, we need more. And so he, he writes from his context. Now, now, John's context is unique because he writes in a very relational way. John is, by some, termed the best friend of Jesus. So he is, he is, he is to believe to be at least one of the closest of the, of the three very close to Jesus. We find this in, in, in the gospel narrative that Peter, James, and John seem to have this unique relationship with Jesus. There seems to be this affinity they have for one another. And so it is safe to say that John was one of the best friends Jesus ever had in his three and a half or so year ministry. Now, 50 years later, Grandpa John writes from ancient Ephesus, but he is very much still the best friend of Jesus. And he's going to write from a relational context. Context. Now, John will make the argument, we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but his argument will be very simple. He'll, he'll, he'll make this case that Christianity is not so much about forgiveness as it is about friendship. John would like to go on record as an old man, still the best friend of Jesus, who experienced this extraordinary connection, relationship, affinity, and close proximity to Jesus. He wants to go on record to say that Christianity is not merely forgiveness. Forgiveness ought to be sung about and celebrated and declared and received and believed, but that forgiveness is to fuel us into a friendship, a relationship with Jesus Christ that is real and authentic and transformative. So he seems to invite us, anyone who will listen, anyone who will receive and accept his words, invite us into that same relationship. Much has been made of John's writings. Many people believe that John writes to kind of, uh, as a test of faith. But I don't believe that John is writing here uh, trying to determine whether or not you're saved. I don't actually think that's John's focus. I think John's focus here is actually, do you have a friendship with the one who saved you? It's one thing to be saved, and I'm glad that you're saved. And if, if you hadn't experienced the saving power of Jesus, you can do that today, tonight. It's going to be awesome. But, 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 but the real question becomes, okay, if somebody can save you or has saved you, if this somewhat supernatural superhero has swooped down and saved your soul, wouldn't you want to meet him? Wouldn't you want to know him? Wouldn't you want to thank him? Wouldn't you want to walk with him? And so, and so, and so that's, this, is, this is the pre-sermon. This doesn't count. This is just introduction. But that's where I've been at personally. And I sat in an airplane, and I was flying to L.A. as I do every week. And I started to cry because I had realized in my own life, so much of my life spiritually, I had settled for salvation, settled for forgiveness, settled for a good sermon series that I preached settled for good music with other Christians around, settled for knowledge, and I had not leaned into, anticipated, expected, believed, reached out for true friendship with Jesus. I know pastor's been talking about crossing over, and man, there is, when he said that and he texted that to me, something just resonated inside of me. Like I, There's so many things spiritually I want to cross over. I don't want to spend the rest of my life on the side of just celebrating forgiveness and I'm saved. I want to cross over to truly know Jesus and live life with him and have him alter my social experience. So by the time we get to 1 John in chapter 4, John is well into his thoughts. He's well into his case. And John ultimately will hang his hat on the issue of love. He will hang his hat on those who are friends of God. You will be able to see it, not just in the way they live, but the way they love, because John defines living by loving. And if you're not loving, you're not living. But if you're loving, you're living. And God's standard of living is based on his standard of loving. And so John wants to make this case. And so I just want to, I want to present it, put it before you for your consideration and prayer, and then we'll, we'll close in prayer before you know it. It'll be right on time. And um, then I'm going to go to a chapel for our team, for God's team. And uh, I don't even know if you guys have chapels, just to be honest. I don't even think the Panthers have chapel. So, you know, we'll just leave that in the hands of God. First John. Chapter 4. I almost asked Pastor Stephen to do chapel. Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing for the Seahawks? For him just to come and just sow a deposit and a word into our team? I didn't trust him. I thought, I thought he might curse him or something, so I can't, can't be having that. First John 4, 7. Grandpa John now. Here he is. In the end of his life, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. 
And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. In this is love. This is one of my favorite verses because John is about to define for us love, but watch the unorthodox way in which he does. He says, this is the definition of love. In this is love, comma, not that we loved God. That's a radical declaration from the Spirit of God. By the way, this, this, this book, this story, this narrative is not so much about your love. You didn't even have love for God. It's about God's love that initiated contact with you, and because he loved first, you love him back. That's it's really good doctrine to consider. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. So that the theme of our life should not really be our love for God, but the ultimate theme of our life should be God's love for us. I think we need to sing more about God's love for us. We need to preach more about God's love for us. Talk more about God's love for us. The power is in God's love for us, not our love for God. So then he says, and he sent his son to be the propitiation. It's a big theological word, which means he took our place. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So he was the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And the last verse we'll read, no one has ever seen God. Semicolon, if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Isn't that beautiful? It might be, um, and I think this is what most preachers say in any passage that they choose, so I'm going to say it. It might be the single most important passage that John ever wrote. It makes sense since I'm preaching from it. It might be the single most important passage. Every, every, like, when can you ever argue with a preacher who says that? Like Every part of the Bible is probably the most important part of the Bible. So it's one of those statements that preachers make that you can't disagree with, which I love, right? This is the single most important thing John ever wrote in his life. Amen? Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, thank you so much for your grace, your love. We dedicate these few moments now around your book, your story. We ask that it would come to, a, come to life in our hearing. Help us to experience and encounter you in a real and authentic and a genuine way. And Lord, tomorrow we're asking that your will be done. And Lord, you know what I believe your will is. So let it be. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Do, you, um, do, you, do, you go to, do you do you go to movies a lot? Are you a movie goer? Any 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 movie watchers here? You see see how that works? Did you notice that? That's church people. No one like, woo! No one cheered. We all were like, yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> right? Because it's church, and we don't really know. Like we all go to movies, but we're not like supposed to like talk too much about movies. Now, for some of you that didn't know Jesus in the 80s, can I fill you in on a little bit of stuff that was going on in the 80s amongst the Christian community? We weren't sure in the 80s if you went to a movie and simultaneously at the same time when you were at the movie house, if Jesus split the sky and returned with a, you know, he's got a, he's got a, he's got, he's got a tattoo on his thigh, by the way, and a white horse. By the way, he's got a tattoo. Jesus has a tattoo. Okay, so if you don't like tattoos, you hate Jesus. I'm kidding. Calm down. It's a joke. Anyways, so that one works well in LA, you know, West Coast liberal. But um, you know what I mean. But we used to kind of wonder. This is this is like mid '80s. A lot of us Christians, we did, we did. We wondered like, if you're at a movie and Jesus returns. Will he include you in those he takes home? We did. And like, if you're gonna go to a long movie, you're taking a big risk. You're gonna go to one of those three hour ones, you're like, Jesus, please don't you come back. Not now. I know this is PG 13, Lord, but you'll forgive me, right? I grew up like people would tell me movies, and if it was rated R, I'd be like, whoa. I knew that they weren't saved. No, I, I'm serious, I knew it. Like, rated R, hell. You know, while I'm talking about this, I'm thinking, Things were clearer in the 80s. You know what I mean? Like we just we knew who was in and who was out. You know, movies, you're out. <laughs> Tattoos, definitely going down. There's a special place reserved in hell for those who've marked their bodies. Right? So it's the 80s. So I didn't go to my first movie till I was 12. This is a true story. Okay, my first movie, and I watched a ton on VHS, but I never went to like a movie house because I wanted to, I wanted to go with the great cloud of witnesses. So I picked this up to drink it, and I just put it right back down. You guys got me distracted. Um, 
So, so I think my first movie when I was like 12, I think it was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or something like that. And, and, um, but, but of course, I've grown up now and realized that there was an error in our theology, so I've been making up for lost time. So I like to go to movies. I enjoy movies. Only really uplifting movies and godly movies. Uh, only movies that are um, Christian. And I also um, drink Christian water, and I wear Christian clothes, and I eat Christian food. But I went to a movie recently with my cousin. And, and here's what I'm getting to. This is, what kind of movie watcher are you? Like, let's be honest, okay? Come on. It's the night before the big game. Let's have some fun. What, what kind of movie watcher are you, right? Now, I'm going to zero in on one movie group of watchers. Okay? Um, because I don't know how to say this. Like I, it's not like I don't like you guys. Okay, I do. I don't like you. I don't like this particular group of movie watchers. And you know who you are. I'm going to call you uh, your commentators. You're uh, mixed with realists. And you're the people that spoil what movies are all about. I just, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? For the rest of us in the real world, huh, why do I go to a movie? Oh, let's think about it. To be entertained. That's all. That's all. I want to forget about the responsibilities I have outside that movie theater. I want to forget that I'm a pastor. I want to forget that I'm responsible for three little human beings. Right? I, just want to, I just want to get lost in the story, right? So I'm not a critic. I don't care. I don't, if you make me cry, laugh, I'm, I'm in. I just want to just, just take me on a journey, right? I don't care. But I, I asked my cousin, like, this is a few years ago. He, he came to me, and, and we're going to go to a movie. So we choose, like, Spider-Man, like, 42. How many more Spider-Mans can we endure? <laughs> Dear God, how many more Batmans and Supermans and Spider-Mans and Ant-Mans? And what's going on around here? But anyway, so we go to Spider-Man 48, and... Um, and I'm pumped. I'm always pumped to go to movies. It's like, this is awesome, right? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. yes, shoot little sticky webs out of your wrist, Peter Parker, and fly, right? <laughs> so we sit out, and we're like 15 minutes in. My cousin, who will remain unnamed, Jesse McKinney, kidding. He's sitting next to me. Now he's kind of, Pastor Steven, he's kind of in the industry. Okay? He recently did a Lifetime movie, and he played Luke Perry in the 90210, like the making of 90210, okay? Yeah, he cussed too, so I was like, you're out of the family. Um, <laughs> I was like, I can't stand by. So, so he, I think he's like, I'm in the industry, you know, like I am Luke Perry. So he's like, he's kind of like an artist, and he married a Brazilian model, and that didn't help. So <laughs> he's sitting next to me, and... We're like, we're like 15 minutes into like Peter Parker's journey, you know, like gets bit by a spider and suddenly like accidentally his wrists go like this and, and he's like, ah, oh, you know, and he's like flying through Manhattan and, and, and true story, Jesse's sitting next to me and he goes, ha, yeah, right. <laughs> he, this, this really happened. I go, what, bro? He's like, impossible. Oh my God. I literally say this, I go, look, it's that loud, by the way. He's, again, you commentators, you don't care about the movie theater. You feel like everyone wants to hear your artistic critique. We don't. <laughs> yeah, right, impossible. I, go, are you, I call him Rooster. I'm like, Rooster, are you serious right now? He goes, I said, I want you to get that the movie ticket right now. Get it out, get it out of here. You still have it? Yeah, pull it out. What does it say on there? It says Spider-Man. A little, a little computer tech named Peter Parker with glasses is going to get bit by a spider. And because he gets bit by a spider, he's going to shoot little sticky webs out of his wrist, and they're going to stick to big, tall buildings, and he's going to swing around, and he's going to kiss girls upside down. And I want you to ask yourself if this is supposed to be realistic. We went to Spider-Man. He like, he's like, later he's like, it's horrible CGI. I'm like, oh my word, I don't even know what that means. I just for a second, I want to believe that I'm Peter Parker. Right, like, I counted six times he used the word impossible at Spider-Man. I will never go to another movie with Luke Perry, I mean my cousin Jesse. Impossible. Now, you're thinking to yourself, 
What does this story have to do with the Bible? When does this preacher preach the word? I have no idea what that story has any connection to God's word. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's a beautiful metaphor. Listen closely. Upon reading 1 John chapter 4, this literally happened to me. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Now, this might not have hit you the same way, but this is how it hit me. When John says, Beloved, let us love one another, the first word that came to mind is my cousin's favorite word in Spider Man 42 impossible. What is this, a fictional idea? What is this, a fantasy? Now, that might not hit you the same way because it seems pretty harmless, doesn't it? Beloved, let us love one another. What's so Peter Parker about that? What's so unbelievable about that? What's so impossible about that? What's so fictional about that, Judah? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the truth is, when he says, let us love one another, now, now uh, uh, upon first glance, you think to yourself, love, love one another. I'm totally down for that. I love love. Like, we live in a culture, we're in love with love. Are we not? Love is just, I love love. I love the feeling of love, the concept of love, the ideas of love, the, 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 the expressions of love. Like, I, I, I love love. And so you're thinking to yourself, I'm, I, that doesn't sound impossible. It doesn't sound like a fictional superhero comic book. I, I can love people. In fact, I love my family and I love my friends. In fact, I'm sitting with them. They're in the row right now. I love them. They love me. We have an affinity for each other. We share some commonality. We enjoy the similar hobbies. Like, I, 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 I let us love one another. What's so difficult and challenging and impossible? about that. I, I love a lot of people, and generally, I love love. Am I the only one that like watches commercials with like abandoned animals and gets moved emotionally and for a moment considers that I am actually a very good person because I feel empathy for these animals? Are you ever impressed by your own nobility? Do you ever watch commercials and cry and go, I'm so sensitive to people. I love that about me. You know what I mean? Like, most people aren't even moved by the plight of humanity, but me? No, I am moved in the middle of a football game. A commercial touches my soul. I'm so sensitive. Thank you, God, for making me so compassionate. This is amazing, right? You watch some commercial about an entire continent or country that needs aid, and you're moved, and you give money, and like it's just, I was like, love one another. I'm really good at that. Until you investigate a little bit further and you realize that what John is saying is actually not that basic culturally familiar and predominant thought about love. He's not saying love those who are like you. He's not saying love those who love you. He's not saying love those that you get along with. He's not saying, he, he's saying, he's saying, I want you to love, I want you to love people, agape, it's rooted in that word agape, which of course is not brotherly love or romantic love. It's God love that's unconditional, needs no reciprocation. He's like, I want you to unconditionally put yourself out there, extend yourself and serve people and alter your schedule and your budget and your convenience to love people, care for them, check in on them and take care of them, even, even if they don't like you that much. Let us love one another. You know, the moment you're like, I want to cross over. I want to take it to the next level. In my relationship with God, you run into one of these impossible verses. Nobody does that. Nobody loves their enemies. Like, it makes for good preaching. It does. And it's really cool when you read it and you're like, oh, that's good, Jesus. Thanks for saying that. But no one does it. Like, no one does it. Like, you, you, you meet people and you're like, oh, yeah, good to see you again. Do you know that you don't follow me on Instagram? You know? Oh, no, I don't care. I don't care that you follow me. I just wanted to say you don't. You never comment on my photos. It's cool. It's not a big deal. Like, that's the day we live in. Like, you don't follow me, so I don't follow you. You never like my photos. I don't like your photos. Like, we got a long way to go here, church. John says, let us love one another. Wait, what? Yeah, I, 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 want you to, I want you to go beyond the norm. I want you to inconvenience yourself, alter your schedule, alter your budgets, and I want you to serve and care and bless and give and love any way possible for, for those that, I don't know, annoy you. For those that bug you. Like, I'd much rather pray for a continent than like, be nice to a cousin. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it just feels better just to send money on a missions trip to Africa than like, uh, call your annoying cousin and give them time. Ugh. 
can I just join a missions trip? <laughs> Rather than like talk to my neighbor who's taken a little bit of my lot line with his fence. You know, I mean, like, I'd much rather be like on team at church and like serve and love and pray than than like talk to my uncle who just annoys me and has just uh, offended my family so many times. Like, just put me on team. I'd love to like direct traffic and put people in parking spots, but I don't want to like call my uncle <laughs> and like make up. I don't want. I don't. Wanna, I don't want to do that. Let us love one another. Who who lives like that? Who who does that? Of course, the answer. Now, again, what is John saying? He's saying, when you find friendship with Jesus, when you walk with him and you work with him and you watch how he does life, love becomes ridiculously apparent and it starts to express itself socially in unconditional ways. Truth be told, you know Jesus to the level you love and live like Jesus. I mean, that's, that's what I didn't come up with that. That's what John is saying. Jesus has, how should I say, permeated your life to the level that your social experience has changed. I mean, that's challenging for me. I, I start thinking about these thoughts, and we're not going to go much longer. You stay with me, but I start thinking about these thoughts. And I mean, can we just talk about the obvious one? Like, John just wants to go on record to say there's really no place for like mean, rude Christians. It just doesn't make any sense at all. Christians who don't tip big in restaurants, like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense. If, if you know Jesus, not, 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 not if you're going to get into heaven, but I mean, if you're a friend of Jesus, it transforms your social experience. He says, beloved, I love that word beloved because that's proper doctrinal order. Beloved means what? You be loved by God. So you are loved by God. Beloved, God's love is always first. It's always first because God is always first. He's always the initiator. We're the responder. Beloved, you be loved by God. Let us, I love that us, it's a group project. Let us love us. This is crazy because John wants to say, love starts in this room. Before the ends of the earth and the mission trips you want to go on, it starts in this room. The people in your row or the person who showed up tonight and you thought, I didn't think they came to Saturday night anymore. I moved to Saturday night because I thought they went on Sundays. And now they're here on Saturday nights. I will have to move back to Sundays. <laughs> Let us love one another. He goes on, and basically the rest of our passage, which we'll spend the next nine minutes on, the rest of our passage is why and how. That's it. Why and how. And he says, let us love one another, for love is from God. Now, I love this part. Love is from God. The last thing Grandpa John, 50 years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, wants you to do is to walk out of this space or whatever campus you're watching from right now, walk out of that space and try to love like Jesus. It's the last thing he wants you to do. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do better. I am. I'm serious. I am gonna just be nicer. I'm generally gonna look out for senior citizens. I'm gonna give bigger tips. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to send an email to that uncle and just tell him it's all good in the hood. But like, I'm going to try. No, 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 no. Let us love one another, for love is from God, he says in verse 7. From God. So this love, not romantic, brotherly, it's not love based on affinity or a hobby, a commonality, or a football team. That's a deep love, but he's not talking about that love. He's talking about unconditional love, love that needs no reciprocation, love that needs no acknowledgement. He says this kind of love comes from where? From God, not from you, not from me, not from within, from God. So it comes from God. Going on in verse 7, if we can put it up on the screen because I can't remember it. Love. You know that's why pastors put the scriptures up there, because they don't have them memorized. Pastor Stephen does, but most of us average guys don't. Love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. I love that word born. 
Because what he's saying is this love comes from God, and God has to do something to you on the inside for this to even be possible. He has to initiate something on the inside. We'll talk more about that. He goes and knows God, and then check out verse 8. Verse 8, he says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, again, he's not saying here, if you don't love with this unconditional agape love, you're out and you're not in and you're not going to heaven and you're not saved. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about, it's not a test of faith. This is a test of friendship. He says, anyone, can you put it back up there because I forgot it, thanks. Anyone who does not love, he just wants to say, you don't know God like you think you do. Grandpa John's, he's cool. He's not mad at you. He's just saying, you run around talking about, oh, I know Jesus. I've been saved 48 years, and I know, praise the Lord, everybody, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen. He, he's saying, that's great. You got all the Christian statements, which is cool. It's cool. Like, you got all the cliches, and, you know, and, you know, I do my best, and God does the rest, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And you got all of that, but he's saying, he's saying, the test of your orthodoxy, the test of your faith is not knowledge. It's not church attendance, which I highly recommend as a local church pastor. He's not talking about how much you give in the offering. He says the ultimate test of whether or not you know, you want to cross over, you want to go to the next level in friendship and relationship. He said the true test is, again, you, are, you know God to the level that you love like God. That is one of the most discouraging things I'll say tonight, at least for me personally, because all of a sudden it's like, Whoa. It brings into focus. Because for me, can I just say as preachers, man, we are famous. I, man, if I preach a good sermon, I am convinced that I am close to God. I am. I go home, and this is so embarrassing to admit, but after preaching a good sermon, I'll go home and think to myself, if I had any doubts whether or not I was close to Jesus, today is proof. I killed it. This is the stuff that, again, Pastor Stevens way beyond this, but for the rest of us, like, like we go home and, we, and, we, and our wife asks us, how'd it go? And you're like, I killed it. You know, like, Jesus has to be so proud of me. You know? But John says, no, you, you, you know God to the level that you love. Not your sermons, not your volunteer, not your missions trip. And your budget that you give to it, do you love like him? He goes on in verse 9 and he says, What does he say? That's it. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. Okay, this is where I'm gonna land the plane. We'll just stop right here. Okay, you put your tray tables up and your seat back in the upright lock position. Okay, I, I fly too much clearly. Okay, but we, we're gonna, we're gonna hit, the, hit the runway here. He says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son in the world that we might live through him. Okay, I'm reading this the other day, and I'm thinking, ooh, I like this song. We used to sing about this song growing up in church. The love of God was made manifest to defeat the enemy, and he loves us. And I'm like, oh, it was manifest for us, for us, for us, for Elevation Church, right here, 2016, Charlotte, North Carolina, come on, for us. But then I realized what John's talking about, the us here, the us here ultimately would include you, but not initially. It had nothing to do with you. You know what John is saying? John is saying Jesus laid down his life for his, his crew. Now, I want to go on record to say that if I was Jesus, in terms of my social experience, it would be far more convenient for me to be, how should I say, a recluse or a maverick. Think about it. If I was Jesus, don't, don't, don't get into the complexities and the layers and the drama that happens when you make friends with broken, fragmented friends. Like, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't get uncles and aunts and all that stuff. Don't have family reunions. Don't, don't get friends that either like or dislike or never follow you on social media. Like, don't get people who could hurt you and drama and traumatize you. Like, just, just build you a tree fort outside of Jerusalem. Come in, float in, do what you need to do, and then go back out there and everybody from a distance will be like, that's where Jesus is. But he doesn't have friends because furthermore, how can you as God choose favorites? So you really shouldn't, you know, really get into the thick of real life. But that's not at all how Jesus did it. And I, and I, and I would argue that he could have still pulled off the redemptive work had he lived in a tree fort and not socialized with anyone. But instead, what does he do? He gets 12 knuckleheads all of whom we believe are under the age of 21 except Peter, and Peter acted like he was 16. <laughs> and they hurt him. They betrayed him. 
They manipulated him, sent their mom to ask for favors of him. He experienced all of it. He's trying to explain his redemptive death. And one of their moms shows up to say, well, that's sweet, Jesus, hold that thought. Can my boy sit on your right and left when this whole thing happens in heaven? It's like, Jesus, why did you befriend these people? You don't need to do this. But notice what John says. John says, Jesus laid down his life for people who hurt him, manipulated him, spoke ill of him, brutalized him, betrayed him, and furthermore stole his money. Yeah, he did. His love was manifested among us. And all of a sudden, it's like, okay, I see what you're asking us to do. You know what John is doing, right? John is saying, I walked with Jesus. I had meals with Jesus. I hung out years with Jesus, and I saw him do what he did, and then I was there at the cross. John was one of the few disciples, maybe the only one at the foot of the cross, when he died and suffocated in his own blood. And by the way, he used one of his seven statements on the cross to make sure that his mom was taken care of. Jesus was in the thick of the social experience of the earth, and now John, in reflection and this relationship that he continues to share with Jesus at the end of his life, he says, do you know what matters ultimately to Jesus is that we would serve those close to us who hurt us and manipulate us and cheat us and steal from us, that we would live like Jesus lived towards us. And then John says, no one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God, but when we love like this, God abides in us, which means his love surfaces amongst us, and then it's perfected, and all of a sudden, a portrait of Jesus in Charlotte and beyond and all the campuses start to take shape, and now what was blurry, who is God, what does he look like, what does he, what does he do, what are his priorities, our love for one another, this unconditional, ridiculous, extensive life that we commit ourselves to love those who do not love us, all of a sudden the picture of Jesus takes shape in a community and a portion of the country, and then perfected means the picture comes into clear focus, 3D version, brilliant colors, and all of a sudden the city steps back and says, is that what God looks like? And I ask you, is any endeavor more important than that, than our communities and our neighborhoods and our cul-de-sacs and our cities seeing Jesus. Would you close your eyes just for a moment? Let me pray for you. Just before we I hand this back to Pastor, if you're here and as I'm talking about this extraordinary Jesus, I promise you he's changed my life, man. He is the ultimate meaning and purpose. If you're here and you say, Judah, all right, I believe. The Bible says, whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. If you want to express your belief in Jesus, you believe. And by believing, what I mean is you receive the forgiveness that only he offers. You're here to say, look, I, I, I want to receive Jesus. I want to receive his forgiveness for my error, my wrong, and my sin right now in this moment. I want to express my reception. I want to express my belief. I'm going to ask you to do something. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. And the reason I ask you to lift your hand is I honestly believe when you respond outwardly to what's happening inwardly, it seems to solidify it in your soul. You know who you are. God is in this place. It's not an accident that you're here. If you want to follow this Jesus, if you want to know this Jesus, if you want to be the recipient of this unconditional love, on the count of three, you shoot up your hand. One, God loves you so much. Two, I truly believe you'll never be the same. Three, if that's you, all over the room, would you lift up your hand and say, man, I'd like to make this decision to receive, to receive the forgiveness that only Jesus offers. That's amazing. God, I thank you for every single hand that was raised in this room, and right now, God, with that hand raised, I thank you that what we're declaring is that we believe and we receive you and we accept you. And I thank you that all of our error and all of our wrong and all of our sin is covered in one moment of faith. Your grace is enough and your grace is sufficient. And Father, I pray for Elevation Church. Lord, as it continues to grow in influence and impact, Lord, may this be a beacon of hope to the ends of the earth. And Father, may they see our love. May they see our commitment one to another to live this extraordinary, extensive life that looks like you, Jesus. Father, may our city see Jesus as they see us. We love you, Lord. It's our privilege and our honor to live this life for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen.